The original Altair 8800 computer played a very important role in the start of the microcomputer revolution, and as such, it's a great computer to own if you want to experience this period of history hands-on. Unfortunately, it's not easy to get an Altair 8800, and if you can find it on eBay, it often goes for $5,000 or more. And even then, it's probably not a working computer. You're probably going to have to invest some time to restore it and keep it in working condition. Now, fortunately, over the last several years, a few hobbyists have put together exact replicas or drop-in equivalents of several of the most important Altair boards. What that means is you can build a fully functional Altair 8800 computer from scratch using nothing but new equipment. And that's the computer we have here in front of us today, brand new circa 2018 Altair 8800. We're going to go ahead and uh, do a quick demo. We're connected to an original Altair 8-inch floppy drive here. We're going to boot and run Altair Disk Basic. And then we'll go ahead and open it up, take a look inside, and see how this computer goes together. All right, let's go ahead and turn it on. Slightly newer generation floppy drive turns on with a switch up like you expect. The original Altair turned on with a switch down. Let's go ahead and do a hard reset. Put the disk basic floppy in. All right, so in order to boot a floppy, um, you had to have the disk bootloader prom in the computer. That's up at 177400. We'll examine that address. That sets the 8080's PC to that address. Also shows you the content of the first location in that prom. Uh, that will allow us to then run the bootloader prom. But before we do that, we have to set these first four cent switches to tell BASIC what type of serial port we're using to talk to the uh, console. We'll set that to 0001, which will tell BASIC we're using uh, one of Altair's two SIO boards with one stop bit. All right, now we're ready to boot. We'll depress the run button. And you can see the activities. It reads about six tracks. All right, now we're not going to get a great view of the monitor. I kind of want to keep the computer and the monitor of the terminal in view at once. Basically, some startup prompts asking for memory size. I'll hit return and let it size memory. Uh, line printer, you have to respond with something. I'll put in O for OK data. Highest disk number is zero. We have just one disk. They're labeled zero, one, two, and three. How many files? I'll say we have two open. And before we can do anything, we have to mount the disk. So I'll go ahead and do that command. This is going through all 77 tracks on the disk making a map of free space. Every time you see the lights flicker, that's another track. The process takes about 15 seconds. It's a fairly efficient routine. All right, now that it's done, we can look at the directory of files, and that's the files command. All right, we're going to go ahead and load a program. We'll load a program called the USA. Very quick. Just a short program. Let's go ahead and run it. It's doing a five-second countdown before it blasts this rocket off. And there it goes. We thought that was pretty impressive stuff, and we had to show our friends in the day. All right, so we've got our brand-new computer connected to a vintage 8-inch floppy and a vintage terminal running just like uh, an original Altair would have. Now, MITS themselves made three different versions of the Altair 8800, there was the original 8800, the 8800A, and then finally the 8800B. Now I'm going to call this new computer the 8800C to, number one, acknowledge the fact that, no, it is not one of the original Altairs. This was not made by MITS. But number two, to emphasize that it really is an Altair 8800. It's fully functional and behaves just like the original Altair. In fact, it's closer to the original Altair than it is to the 8800B. Any software would run the same, any boards you put in will behave the same, uh, whether they're MITS boards or somebody else's, it is an Altair 8800. But we'll call it the Altair 8800C. All right, next we're gonna go ahead and uh, take the top off this computer and take a look inside and see how it went together. Taking a look inside the computer, the first board we see here is the CPU board. This is an exact replica of the original Altair 8800 CPU board. If you want your computer to behave exactly like the original, especially when it comes to front panel operation, then you're going to want the original board or this exact replica so it behaves exactly the same. Now, interestingly, even though this is actually an old board design, pretty much all the parts are still available. You can buy them new. And those that aren't still available, like the 8080 CPU itself, are readily available, uh, readily available on the surplus market. 
All right, let's go ahead and remove this board. Take a look at the next one. Next, we have a drop-in equivalent for the large front panel board that has all the LEDs and switches on it. In the original, a large hand-wired harness of about 70 wires ran across the board down here to the motherboard to pick up the bus signals. Here you can clearly see instead, we have a nice little ribbon cable running to this board, which then provides the interface to all these signals. But let's go take a look at the original Altair first to see how that was done. Here we're looking inside the original Altair. We can see the front panel board, all the switches and LEDs are on the front side of that board. And you can also see this large harness of wires that connects the front panel down to the S100 bus where it picks up all the signals. And then some of the wires also go to this connector which hooks to the CPU board. It's about 70 wires altogether. Those had to all be measured and cut and stripped and then soldered. And as you can tell, it's quite a complex harness. And if you had to work on the front panel board or work on a motherboard, then these are permanently tethered together now. And it makes that process of working on it difficult without stressing those wires. And it was not unusual for some of these connections, especially over here, to break when you worked on one or two of them, especially as these got older. So it was a tedious process to wire and it made working on the board very difficult because you're now tethered to the motherboard. And also over here, you see the 120 volts coming into the switch. This also tethered the board. So you're tethered on this side and on that side. It was just not a very easy to work on system uh, once it was built. This concept of using a ribbon cable to connect the front panel signals to an interface board in order to get to all the S100 signals was used by MITS in the Altair 8800B that came out a little bit later. Now, even though this uses that same configuration, the electrical and logical interface of all this is actually much closer to that of the 8800 than it is the 8800B. Another reason for going with this combination of front panel interface board has to do with the cabinet we're in. The original cabinet for the Altair was made by a company called Optima. And unfortunately, that cabinet is no longer available. The only cabinet I know of that's even close to the original is this one we have here for the Altair 8800 clone. Now, unfortunately, the clone cabinet was never really designed to handle the real Altair and its S100 bus and front panel board. But interestingly, the original front panel does fit inside this bracket you see here. Unfortunately, once you put it in, you can no longer then get to the screws and the studs required to attach the front dress panel and to fully mount it inside the cabinet. So one thing this board does is it's the right size to allow you to have access to the screws and hardware you need in order to finish mounting this into the cabinet and to the front panel. And one last thing, if you look over here in the back, you see that the 120 volts is connectorized on this. So you can easily disconnect this front panel from power and from the bus uh, to make things easier to work on if you have to. All right, so let's go ahead and remove this board. And next, we have the Altair floppy disk controller board. If you want to run any original Altair software that was disk-based, that includes Altair Disk Basic, Altair DOS, um, and then any third-party software that came along later, like CPM for the Altair, you have to use the Altair floppy disk controller. Now, this controller you see here is a drop-in equivalent for the original Altair floppy controller. The original was a two-board set. This one squeezes it into just one board. Now, this is called the Altair FDC Plus, plus meaning it provides some additional features you can use if you want. Um, but what we saw during that demo was just this board acting as a 100% transparent replacement for the original controller. Also, if you want to hook to an original Altair drive, you have to use one of the Altair controllers as well because the electrical interface to the original Altair drives is not the common Shugart 50-pin standard for 8-inch or the 34-pin uh, standard that came along later. It's completely unique to MIT, so you pretty much have to go with this floppy disk controller. All right, so after you've got the floppy controller in there, you probably need some RAM. Now, fortunately, RAM is not nearly as Altair specific as the first several boards in the front panel that we've looked at. In fact, most any RAM board will work um, as long as it can handle the front panel deposits that are used in the Altair 8800. 
Uh, most of your original boards will all do this, original meaning like 4Ks, 8Ks, 16Ks. Some of the 64 bo uh, 64K boards that came along later didn't support the way the Altair did front panel deposits. So um, if you want to use one of those boards, you're going to have to look closely for um, a switch option or a jumper option, something that talks about front panel operation or talks about using the M right signal for deposits. Uh, that way you'll have a memory board that probably will work with the way the Altair does deposits. In general, I'd steer away from DRAM boards. Uh, the dynamic RAMs just aren't quite what you need to work 100% uh, reliably with the front panel. Sometimes the timing gets in the way of each other. So I would stay away from the dynamic RAM boards. Now in keeping with the theme of using all new equipment, I'm going to take advantage of one of the features of this Altair FDC Plus, and that is it includes 64K of RAM that you can optionally enable if you want. So our RAM in this system is coming as one of the options on this FDC board. Um, the other thing you need in your system is probably a ROM card. If you want to use the disk boot loader prom, you're going to need a ROM card. If you're just running cassette, um, running basic off a cassette or running paper tape, you might want the multi-boot loader prom, which saved you having to put bootloaders in on the front panel. Um, prom card is even more generic than the RAM card. In fact, there's really no restrictions on that. I mean, you can use a card for a 2708 or 2716, even though the original PROMs were the smaller 1702s. You can always program the proper code into those EPROMs. Now again, keeping along the lines of nothing but new equipment in this particular version, I'm using one more feature of this FDC Plus board, and that is it has PROM space on it, um, up to 8K worth. And so right now we're using just the top 256 bytes in order to hold the disk bootloader PROM. All right, now finally, you're gonna to have to have some sort of console I.O. The um, Altair software only works with serial boards that they support, and there's only a few of them. Their most popular was the 2SIO, which provided two ports using Motorola UARTs. And this board you're looking at here is a drop-in equivalent for the original Altair 2SIO board. That 2SIO board is very hard to find, and when you do find them, they're often going for three, $400. So this board is a drop-in equivalent, does exactly what that does, and like the floppy disk controller we just looked at, has some enhancements. Uh, probably my favorite enhancement is the fact that you can change the address of this board, change baud rates for both parts, change handshaking lines, whether they're used or not, uh, change from RS-232 to current loop, all with dip switches and simple push-on jumpers, which is completely unlike the original Altair, which required rewiring every time you wanted to change anything, even baud rate. And some of these changes took quite a few wires. So in my hobby world, where I like to jump from configuration to configuration, trying different things, the fact that this can be reconfigured without all those wires makes this a great version of the 2SIO, um, rather than having to use the original with the wires. Some of the other enhancements, you can see a prom over here. We could have used the prom on this board instead of the one on the floppy disk controller, but presently this one's disabled. This board optionally can use ribbon cables to hook to your DB25s in the back, which just saves having to do a bunch of wiring, makes life a little more convenient. You can also have this board configured exactly the same as the original Altair, where it used the, or the original 2SIO board, where it used the the white Molex connectors and you individually wired to DB25. But, uh, so yeah, this is a good drop-in equivalent, kind of nice to have even if you do have a 2SIO available. All right, finally, um, we have the motherboard. Let's take a look and see what we can see here. The uh, original Altair motherboard is actually a four-slot motherboard and um, is available in replicas. You can get replicas and put them in your computer if you wanted. However, I knew I wanted more than four slots and um, the only way to get more than four slots is to wire two of those boards together. Let's go take a look at original Altair and see what I'm talking about. Here we're looking inside an original Altair 8800 and you can see two of the four slot motherboards. And as you can tell here in the middle, in order to make that a single backplane, we have a hundred jumper wires that are soldered to connect those two boards to each other. So rather than wire two of the four slot Altair motherboards together, I chose to go with this nine slot motherboard you see here. This board is still in production and readily available and meets all the requirements of what we need for an Altair motherboard. 
Those requirements are pretty simple. You basically want a totally passive backplane that just connects the connectors to each other in parallel. You don't want active termination. You don't want passive termination, no fancy features. Um, one reason for no termination is because the bus drivers drive their front panel LEDs directly off the CPU board or whoever is in control of the bus. So that's a lot of current right there that you don't want to then add um, having to source the terminating pull downs as well. Also on the CPU board, the data in bus is all pulled up to five volts. So again, you don't want to put terminating resistors in parallel with those on the CPU board. So just a passive backplane. Now this particular backplane has options for either passive termination or active termination. But if you don't stuff any of it, then uh, this is just a totally passive backplane. The other thing you have to worry about is what is done with pins 20, 70, and 53. Those became grounds in the S100 standard that was released a few years after the Altair. So you want to make sure that you have a motherboard that does not um, ground those pins. This particular one uses jumpers so you can choose whether to ground them or not. So of course, in order to work with the front panel, we have those not grounded. Now with all the boards out of the system, we can take a look at the power supply in the back. We're using three switching power supplies instead of linear power supplies. This larger supply is providing the 8 volt rail in the system. These two smaller ones are providing the plus and minus 16 volt rails in the system. The bigger supply is 7.5 volt switcher uh, with 10 amp output. That 10 amp supply is pretty close to the capacity of the original Altair 8800. Just a little bit more headroom. The two smaller supplies are 15 volt, one wired in reverse of the other to give us negative voltage. It outputs about an amp each, which is again pretty close to the original um, in the original Altair for those two supplies. A little bit more headroom. Now the output of these three supplies has some adjustment range, so you can turn this one up to be exactly 8 if you wanted, and these two to be exactly plus and minus 16. But keep in mind in the original Altairs, and frankly pretty much all your S100 computers, those were just approximate voltages that varied depending on the amount of load on the system. The main requirement is that you never want the lowest part of the voltage reaching the boards being below the dropout voltage of the regulators. So for example, on this eight volt supply, you never want what's seen up at the board to be less than about seven volts, which is the dropout uh, voltage of those five volt regulators. Likewise, for the plus and minus 15, typically the target there is a plus and minus 12 volt or, not, or minus nine volt or minus five volt. So as long as it's up over 14, um, you're probably in pretty good shape on those as well. But you can certainly adjust these to be exactly 8, exactly 16, and then minus 16 if you want it. All right, well that about wraps it up for this version of the computer. Uh, we're now going to take just a quick look at taking this same computer and populating it with vintage boards instead. Now lastly, we're going to take a look at populating this computer with vintage boards. It certainly doesn't have to be only new boards. We have our new cabinet here, we have our new power supplies. If we take a look inside though, we have an original 8800 CPU board. That's this right here. We still have to use the new front panel interface and front panel board to work with this cabinet. Behind that is we have an original 16K RAM board from MITS. Behind that is a 2SIO board for our console IO. This is original. And then lastly, we have the cassette interface board with the modem board. These two are strapped together. Um, that's also made by MITS. So this would be a really nice system for running 8K basic from cassette. We've got 16K of RAM, CPU board, cassette interface, all that ready to go. All right, well that does it for this video. Um, you can go to my website. I've dedicated a page to this computer. Go to dramp.com and click on the picture you see of the Altair computers. That page includes information about the 8800, the 8800B, some of the turnkeys. And immediately following that, you'll see an entry for this Altair 8800C, which can then take you to a page where you can learn more about it. I have sources where you can get the boards that were mentioned in this video, um, what the power supply models are, information about uh, the Altair clone cabinet, good things like that that allow you to build one of these uh, your way one day if you ever wanted to. Again, dramp.com as shown right here.